So, this session is entitled Moving to Hemp. Um, and we're welcoming uh, Jeff Kostuik to join us here on stage in just a short moment. He's the Director of Operations for Hemp Genetics International. Um, this session is around the Canadian experience of breeding, agronomics, preparation, growing, harvesting, and the processes X harvest uh, for grain and seed. Now, Jeff grew up um, grain farming with his father in Manitoba, uh, which is a central province in Canada. And prior to working with HGI, Jeff worked for many years with Manitoba Agriculture, where he accumulated over 23 years' experience in small plot research. And his research focused on diversified or value-added crops and cropping systems working on 60 to 70 projects a year, planting uh, 2,500 to 3,000 plots annually. So, ladies and gents, uh, I'd like you to give him a very warm New Zealand welcome as he joins us here on stage right now. Round of applause, please, for Jeff Kostuik. Great, thank you very much. Uh, indeed, a pleasure to be in New Zealand. Uh, I had never been to New Zealand until this year and, and managed to get two trips in within uh, probably about a four month period here. I was in here February, mostly on the South Island, uh, checking out your warm summer and uh, some hemp crops here. And uh, yeah, very pleased to be back here um, in the North Island. And uh, yeah, thanks so much for the hospitality. Thanks to the uh, organizing committee for inviting, and particularly Richard Barge, who I've got to know over a, a few years since he had, we met at a Canadian Hemp Trade Alliance meeting in, I believe it was Calgary, uh, three or four years ago. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, my title, I changed the title a little bit. Somebody else had given me this title for a, uh, a talk I did in, in, in New York and how to farm, harvest, and store the world's most versatile plant. And I looked at that last night and I almost changed it because I don't think that I'm gonna tell you how to do it. I'm gonna tell you how we do it. And um, as, as we know with every farm, everybody has different challenges within the farm. And so what I'm gonna do is tell you my experience, and it is again, uh, my experience that, I've, uh, that I'm presenting here. It's not something that I've uh, read on Google or anything. Uh, I've been in the hemp industry for 20 years now. Uh, most of that is on the research side of things. Um, and now I farm alongside with my brother-in-law, working for the company growing pedigreed seed for hemp genetics. And we farm about 8,000 acres together, of which this year we've got about 500 acres into hemp. And so uh, I'll go through some of our combine modifications and uh, some of the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way and how you can potentially um, adapt that to your own farm or farm system. So again, uh, I don't expect you to follow exactly what I say, but uh, hopefully it gives you an idea of what to expect and, and how, to, how to manage through it. So there's two companies that, that I work for. Hemp Genetics International is our seed company. Some of the varieties that you may have heard of, uh, CFX1, CFX2, um, CRS1, Craig, and then we have three new varieties that are probably just been in the system for about three years. I don't know if we, we've, we actually had it reproduced here at Catani uh, in, in New Zealand, Piccolo and Grandi. And I'll talk a little bit more about why those three new, view, new varieties are a little more interesting and, and what I think, uh, what, I saw in or what I saw in New Zealand here in February. I'm excited about potentially bringing those varieties here to, to help, um, help ease some of the pressures as of harvesting uh, this wonderful crop. The second part of our company is called Hemp Production Services and we are also, we contract with farmers in Canada and I'd like to introduce uh, a colleague of mine who came over with me, Mr. Mark Van Burke and get it, stand up Mark because <laughs> he's, uh, I don't know if how many people have ever seen the show The, the A-Team it was called with uh, Mr. T and stuff. I like to call us either the B team or the D team, and it's not because we're subpar of A, but when we stand together, there's Mark, who looks like this, and there's me, the lowercase b, <laughs> or D, whichever side I happen to be standing on. So, um, but anyway, I, yeah, I've changed that from my twin brother jokes. <laughs> Hopefully that works. So, um, so Hemp Production Services is, um, is our, our marketing food product line. We're a bulk ingredient supplier. Uh, we provide uh, hemp hearts, um, protein powders, oils, uh, three, I guess four or five different protein powders. Um, that's it, I guess, eh? Hemp hearts, yeah. So uh, we're, we don't have our own label or brand, but we are an ingredient supplier. So if anybody's interested in uh, looking for some good quality product um, that can come out of Canada, we're, we'd be pleased to, to, to talk to you. 
So there's a map of Canada. Uh, the colorful green in the very middle is Manitoba, and that's where I uh, reside. Um, the coldest part of the, other than going much further north, but the coldest part of uh, the farming area. Um, our processing plant is also in Manitoba, um, but we're, as a company, we're spread out right across western Canada, so next to it was Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. So my trip here uh, took me from Manitoba to, to Vancouver, which is about a three-hour flight, and then a 14-hour quick little jaunt over the, the, the pond uh, to here. So I'm, yeah, happy to be here. So this is a picture of the farm where I live at. Um, it's a picture of Catani, uh, the, the new variety that we, we have. So it's a pedigreed seed field. This is a registered field. And the four little plots that you can kind of see in the off, off to the right, to your right also, um, those are breeder plots there that, um, that we grow. So again, uh, actively farming. That's a picture, kind of a, give you an idea what the landscape looks like. This was taking picture probably about this time last year, I guess, because the, the canola, where you start to see a little bit of yellow, that would be canola, which is our primary crop that we grow, our cash crop, uh, intermixed with wheat, soybeans, peas, barley, and oats are sort of our main, main crops. What I'd like to talk about, talk about to begin with um, is how to produce or what you need to do to produce high-quality hemp products. What is the market demanding? And that's the first thing that the market is demanding, and, uh, and rightfully so, is a high quality hemp product. Um, there's a lot of different processors in the world right now. Um, we feel quite confidently that we have the best product in the world, to be quite honest. We, we've been at it the longest. We should, <laughs> should have a few tricks. So our processors have been processing since 1998 also, when hemp was legalized. So they basically invented how to dehull hemp properly and how to separate those hulls from the meaty part of the hemp or the hearts. And I'll show you a picture of, of 20 years experience versus about two months experience right away. And then quality always starts in the field. We're, our management group and our ownership are all farmers. I'm a farmer. Um, we understand that quality starts in the field. Uh, we're shipping a raw product uh, at the end of the day and therefore there's very little room for mistakes that are made on the farm. It's very difficult for on the processing side to turn something that is not so good into something that's consumable. So it's very important that we, we touch on that first. And the agronomics all along through the, the growing season are very important to make sure that that product stays um, as good as it can be. And what does that take? It takes a systematic approach basically to maximize that quality and we'll go through that. So with that proper planning and Going to conferences like this is probably the best start. Uh, networking, uh, learning from other people's mistakes, uh, and then trying not to make those same mistakes. Agronomics, uh, I'm an agronomist by trade. That's, uh, that's where my heart lies, and I truly believe that that, again, uh, gives us the benefit to produce a high-quality product. And then one of the finest or final uh, issues is harvest and storage management, and this is where things can really go south. You can grow the crop successfully, you can have a very good yield, uh, but if it's not taken care of in the bin, you basically move from a food quality product to an animal feed or bird seed. So we need to touch on that and make sure that we don't get into that realm of things. In the introduction, um, we talked about breeding. That's again where our system starts and has its strengths. Uh, Dr. Bert Vandenberg, you see a picture. We have two, fu two full-time breeders on staff. And when Canada started growing hemp in 1998, the varieties that we got were mainly the Eastern European varieties. And when they got to Canada, generally speaking, we were looking at about a three meter to four meter to five meter tall plant and trying to harvest with our traditional equipment. And um, we quickly, quickly realized there's two, two ways to attack that, right? Uh, what do you do? Do you start to look at your machinery and put it on stilts to get to the plant? Or do you try and get that plant and go get lower? And we chose the cheaper, well, I wouldn't say cheaper, but the more cheaper for the farmer, definitely. Uh, we didn't have to put uh, many. So what we did is we took that big two-foot head that has all that seed on it, and we just got it closer to the ground. And uh, that's what uh, really helped revolutionize, I guess, the grain industry, and that's what helped push the grain industry in Canada. 20 years into it, we're still not, we still don't have a strong fiber component to our system. There's two fiber plants 
in Canada. Both of them are across the road from each other and an hour from my place, so I feel pretty privileged like that. However, uh, one of them still isn't operational. The, they're very expensive to put together. The whole decortication process is, a, is uh, something that needs to be learned, uh, and it comes at a huge cost. Those, those, both those plants come at a cost of about 35 million Canadian dollars to, to put up. Uh, so not cheap, and uh, you're drawing from a very limited area. So there are challenges for sure. So uh, as far as one of the questions was, what are, what are one of the um, potential options or, or things that, that can move the hemp energy f industry forward? And I do believe fiber is one. Uh, grain has been established. It's, it's been going for a few years now, but I think that opportunity in fiber for new technology, varieties, et cetera, uh, needs to happen. Because in a year like this year, where we have downward pressure from other countries with, that are growing hemp seed, uh, so the, the dollar to the farmer has reduced fairly substantially just within a year in Canada. Uh, we need that crop to be a, that secondary crop or that tertiary crop, whether it's a grain fiber crop or a grain fiber and CBD crop. Um, I think it's very important to make sure that we maintain the value on the farm to keep the farm profitable. So of course with the breeding program, top quality seed, we are firm believers in a certified seed program, particularly with this crop. There's other crops uh, that you might be able to get away, but hemp really wants to, hemp is a, hemp wants to survive. It just wants to survive no matter what. And the amount of pollen that is produced on a crop basis and how far that pollen can carry uh, really creates some additional challenges to maintain that that variety is what you planted is what it's supposed to look like. And so the breeding program, purchasing certified seed, allows us to do that. That we, we, we test at the, our THC at the pedigree level. The farmers don't have to incur that cost anymore. Um, most of our varieties have gone through the process long enough that they, don't even, they aren't even tested for THC in Canada anymore, uh, particularly CFX1, CRS1, and CFX2. And that's a very important part of the the program to, again, uh, minimize the regulatory aspects that the farmers have to go through uh, and maximize production. And then seed varieties, of course, suited somewhat to climate, obviously more so latitude, I would say, than climate being a photo period sensitive crop. We react much more to sunlight than to heat units, where, but we are finding there are some uh, arguments to that, that statement. Um, but generally speaking, uh, the varieties in over 20 years of testing hemp varieties, including the company that I work for now, if I take off my HGI hat and put on my old government hat, I can honestly say that across the board there's not a real lot of difference between for yield on each one of those varieties that I found over the year. Like on a different year with different climate, we would have CRS as the number one. It's been there the longest. It's our Czech variety. The next year, uh, something like X59 would, would be the variety that was uh, the best variety in Canada. So really, you want to get a variety that is adapted to your farm system, your combine and your handling facilities and everything. So that's where it's really important. What we feel is to side yourself with an agronomist who knows the crop, knows those varieties, and is able to guide you uh, in a good way. I'm just going to zip through all these because I kind of hate these fly-ins. It was another slide from somebody. But this, um, this I kind of want to try and hit home with regards to what the process is to ensure that we have a high-quality product moving out. Now, this is a hemp oil flow chart, and we have another one for the d hall. but I'll go through this one first. So when our farmers that we contract grow the crop, um, dry it down to a... Uh, dry it down to a moisture level that we feel is safe uh, in the bin, um, before we start to process, we'll ask that farmer to take a representative sample from that bin and send it into us so that we can test it for micros. So we're testing for bacteria, yeast, mold, uh, any other issues like that because again, as a raw product, essentially we're taking that seed, now whether in this case it's the oil, but it's the raw seed that's pressed under a cold press situation. So we don't have a, a, a natural killing step in there because we want to maintain the quality of that oil and of the product. Same as the D-Hull, we want to take that seed basically with air, hit it against a piece of steel, separate the hearts and the, and the hull, and then in a way uh, obviously keep the, keep the hearts for a food product and, and utilize the hulls elsewhere. 
So when we do that, of course, there's no kill step, no natural kill step with heat or anything additional. So that goes from the farmer, farmer's bin, gets knocked around a bit, and then onto the consumer plate. And you just can't be having something with high yeast, mold, E. coli, or other issues that, that get people sick. It's just, it's just not good for business, obviously. So we take that raw hemp seed, and when he sends a sample in, we just want to kind of know. We, we don't really trust that sample because how do you really probe a, a bin properly? So um, it gives us an idea of what we're starting to work with and uh, how we're going to deal with it, whether, whether we do do an oil press or whatever. And then it gives us an idea of what weed seeds are in there. Many weed seeds and volunteer crops are difficult to clean. We are a non-gluten product uh, in hemp, uh, but with, with the benefit of having that seed head closer to the ground, when we were harvesting those first 20 foot crops, uh, we didn't really have very much wheat in our sample because the wheat never reached that high. But now we've got those crops, they're sort of competing against each other and wheat just happens to be difficult to clean out of hemp, even if you're using a color sorter or any other device. Um, so uh, if we have too much wheat in there, then you start to lose your gluten-free status uh, and you've got to start finding another market. So we get that raw hemp seed, take a look at it, uh, then it goes through the cleaning process, uh, and then into the crush. So from the crush, uh, again, so the, the testing happens from the farmer. Uh, once it's cleaned, there should be another one of those uh, test articles in there. So it comes from the farmer's bin, we test it. It gets cleaned, we test it again because we take a lot of those impurities to see where we're at. Then it goes through the processing situation uh, into either hemp seed oil and then um, into hemp powder. And the hemp powder essentially is the meal that's left over from the crushing of the, of the hemp. We run it through a mill, grind it, and then produce a protein powder. Currently, most of that, all of that, has to go into human food consumption in Canada. Uh, we're cleared to eat hemp seed and hemp meal and hemp everything, but our animals aren't yet. <laughs> so we can't, we can't feed it to our cattle. Um, we can't feed it to our pets. Essentially, some people are. So if anybody's looking for a good uh, nutrient uh, product, we have, a, we have a lot of hemp meal right now that we can make a very good deal if you, uh, if you want to start feeding your, your dairy cows or what have you. Sheep, there's a, there's a odd sheep around here, I think, isn't there? So then, uh, then quality control, then it gets tested one more time. Once that product goes through, then we test it one more time for it. And this is where we start to test for THC, uh, gluten, and everything else. And so. It costs us about $1,500 per lot. Every, every farmer has his own lot code that's associated with it. So if we pick up a bag of, of hauled hemp seed from a product, and if I take a look at that code, I could tell you exactly what, what, how that crop was grown, probably within Western Canada. I can probably tell you what the three crops grown before, because that's the relationship that we have with those farmers, that making sure that they're able to provide a good product for us. Quality control and packaging. So it's quite vigorous, and this is what we're concerned about. These are our limits with regards to uh, microbial. I don't know if the, actually these aren't ours, Mark, are they? This is maybe just the standard, uh, I believe, I got. I think ours are a little tighter than this, actually. But this is an, gives you an idea, I guess, of what we're testing for to make sure that we have food quality and safety. And some of those things, uh, such as salmonella, E. coli, you often hear of some very bad situations that happen when those things go unchecked. And so it's, it, we take that extremely serious. This on the left is our product, our dehauled product. Uh, this was on my kitchen counter. There was a new company that just started up uh, in Manitoba, uh, not far from me. And their product is on the right. Um, so visually, um, which one would I think would you prefer to put on your yogurt or your cereal? Um, for me, I know which one. If you take a, a really zoomed in close look on the right hand side, you'll see pieces of the hull. And I gave this presentation, I guess, in, in Geelong, and there was a nutritionalist just prior to, to me, and it, it was almost a little somewhat embarrassing, but there's so much fiber within that hull that, that the dehulled the stuff kind of lacks fiber to a certain degree because we release that hull. But let's get our fiber from somewhere else and not have to pick the sh shells out of our teeth. That is my position anyway. Let's just worry about the omegas. So that's, that's what the difference in what it, it, you know, the product can look like, and as we're as we're trying to get our product out, we have many, many, many new consumers that are trying hemp for the very first time. We've got one chance to make an impression with them. And if it's the wrong impression, that's your only impression. And so it's so important that we try to maintain the highest quality standards and the best quality we can. 
without naming countries that start with C, <laughs> and not Canada, and the second letter is H, but there's a lot of times product is brought in uh, most recently uh, into Canada uh, with either a organic standard that you have to question or the growing process that's questioned. And that country is able to, pr to produce hemp at a very, very, very low cost. And that's one of the main reasons that we're seeing a glut of seed in the market for this last couple of years and very low prices that are paid to farmers. And we feel that if we can maintain and promote quality, then we're a winner. So on to the agronomy. This is a little bit more. The first part was a little bit more. So any questions about that, that's what Mark's here for as far as the quality and sales and on the end product. This is a little bit more in my kind of wheelhouse, I guess. So what you need to do is take a look at a number of different things with agronomy, of course, field selection, crop rotation, variety selection, seeding, fertility, weed control, harvest. Um, so I'm not going to, uh, this is probably about a three-hour presentation if I were to go through all of that and then and, and we're after lunch and uh, we want to be probably having a beer by the time I would get through a lot of that so we're not going to go into too much detail but I know working with Midlands um, uh, is who I had spent some time with Joe was on right after me uh, very knowledgeable on the agronomy side of things uh, we're dealing with them there uh, uh, they work with us on, a, on distributing seed uh, and I spent a good time with Joe and Angus and, and a number of their crew and very knowledgeable um, as far as the agronomy so there you know there are there are you have been growing hemp in New Zealand for a period of time so it's not like it's new but again need to really stress on the processing side the importance of this and it all relates to it so crop rotation history again I mentioned um, basically trying not to follow it with a with a gluten type uh, cereal herbicide history uh, no residual herbicides. Hemp is very sensitive to most herbicides. We have both an organic um, product and we also have a conventional product. Um, I believe in both, both as, a, as marketing. Uh, they're both very important, uh, but you still have to figure out uh, your fertility. And you'll, I'll show you a slide soon about how much, hemp, how much fertility hemp actually needs or could use to maximize its yield. Uh, it is a hungry plant, so again, for those that totally just want to go to the University of Google, um, don't, read, don't believe everything that you read on there because I've seen so many articles that say hemp can grow with no fertility whatsoever. And actually, I've seen hemp produces nitrogen, which is a totally bogus statement. Um, it has no insects, no pests. It can grow with lots of water. It can grow without any water. And again, it, it, it could maybe survive with a lot of that, but we're not looking at just having a crop that survives. We need a crop that's going to pay the bills and yield well in the farm. So you treat it well. You fertilize it. Uh, weeds, whether it's organic or conventional, you have to control those weeds. Hemp is a very competitive crop, but it's a, it's a slow, out-of-the-gate uh, type of crop. So if you don't give it the advantage uh, right off the get-go, it's not going to... Uh, this is the other one that really drives me is that if you plant hemp into a weedy crop that it'll kill your weeds. Well, hemp doesn't have any aliopathic effect on crops for most, the most part. It won't kill the weeds. If you can have it where it has the advantage over most of those weeds, it will suppress them, but it's not going to kill them. And then trash management prior to seeding and then after seeding. So call it trash when it's, uh, when it's an issue and it's an o whatever, whenever there's an issue, there's an opportunity. So again, I'll, I'll explain what we're doing with the fiber right now, which I don't like, but that's an economic decision that we make in, in Canada. So this is, uh, this is our seeding unit. This is a 60-foot uh, Burgo air seeder. Um, we've just traded two of these in for an 80-foot for, for next year. The middle tank holds the seed and the dry fertilizer and the tank in the back is our anhydrous ammonia which is uh, NH3 or 82 uh, percent nitrogen and uh, it's a one pass system so we're kind of minimum to, to zero till uh, to uh, try and conserve moisture and, and time. These are the openers uh, so the product will put down both the dry fertilizer and the seed usually down the same chute we don't have a, a separation there per se. Packing at this time, hemp is one of the toughest crops to establish. It's a, it's a relatively large seed, which you wouldn't think it'd be that issue, that much of an issue, but it really is. 
It's, if there's any failures in particular, it's establishment, plant establishment. It's, it, I call it a real baby to get established, and then after about three to four weeks, then it turns into a beast because you basically can't kill it, essentially. Uh, we've had hailstorms where it looks like, you know, basically this, uh, the carpet, and as long as there's one little piece of green speck there and a little bit of a node, it starts to grow again and grows out all sideways, and it has that, like I said, that ability to, to really thrive. So you don't want to pack too much. Uh, you want to seed shallow uh, to give it again that advantage to outcompete weeds and uh, seed it into warm soils, which for us is, is an issue. We're, we come out of winter where we've had uh, soil frozen down eight, 10 feet. <laughs> uh, you don't, uh, it's not the first crop that we plant, let's just say that. We've been doing more work with planters. We don't have a lot of corn or soybean in, in Canada per se, like particularly on the prairies. There's a little bit more showing up now with uh, increase in, in uh, early maturing varieties. So we are seeing planters and I'm kind of looking to Joe a little bit more with, and New Zealand because you guys have uh, many more of these planters. So more precision seeding, um, different plates that will work, uh, trying to work with different seeding rates on, on, on that to, to maximize again yield. Get that singulation uh, to help out with those air seeders, you definitely don't see that, that nice two inch gap between each thing. You might see three seeds that are within an inch uh, and then a, a gap of uh, five or six inches. And I'm old enough, I guess, that I switch back and forth between, so metric wise. So I'll, I can, I'll, I'll try and do my best to keep on line, but five to six centimeters and then 10 to 12 centimeters. So. And so this is a, one of the fields, one of the producers we worked with, this is on 15 inch row spacing plant population of around 400,000 plants per, per, per acre and the stand looks pretty good and probably within about a, a week or so that this had full canopy closure. So the advantage of course is if we don't have the herbicides, which we do in Canada, but if it's an organic situation, if we can go a little wider row then we can go with inter-row cultivation to, to control weeds again because it's very important. If you don't, not if you don't, if Seeding, that's the biggest question, I guess, is how wide a rose can we go? And I think the best example is kind of this picture. The, the plant on the left was basically left on its own. And hemp, again, as I said, has that ability to really thrive and do well. And so that looks a little bit more like a marijuana plant, I guess you could say. When given the space, the internodes start to get closer together. It branches out more uh, to increase yield, to, uh, to maintain and re uh, reproduce. The issue with that is if that plant is a six or seven foot tall plant and you want to get every seed off that plant, then basically you have to run your straight cut header right on the ground. And once I start showing you pictures of what happens when you take in too much fiber, you'll make sure that you have much more of a palm tree looking plant as opposed to a Christmas tree looking plant because you want the header to just take the, the two feet of, of seed that goes through and, and minimize how much of the fiber you're going through. Hemp is the strongest naturally occurring fiber in the world, which is absolutely fantastic until you combine it. And then the shittiest thing about hemp is it's the strongest naturally occurring fiber in the world. <laughs> and I'll show you pictures about that. So again, this is the baby part of hemp. Uh, tough, to, uh, tough to get even germination occasionally. Any imperfection that you might have in your field, you plant a, a field of hemp, it'll show it. So whether it's salinity, compaction, uh, pH uh, out of whack, uh, fertility, uh, hemp will be sure to show it. The picture again on the right hand side there, uh, just you can see some of the males are starting to flower already, uh, others it's still just starting to germinate and that's just from compaction, that's where the trucks run all the time. Any other crop you don't even see that but we planted hemp there and all of a sudden it showed up uh, quite substantially. The picture on the left was just a very big rain, probably within two or three days after seeding. Sheeting kind of happened, we had some sheet erosion and it covered the seed and had issues. This is a field of a pedigree grower of ours. This is a variety called Grandy. Um, this is a 640 acre field where he had a two inch rain, a five centimeter, 10 centimeter rain. Uh, about a week after planting and all the low spots filled up and basically hemp wasn't able to survive in those low spots and that's what you get. So where we, where we run into a quality issue here is what there's something's going to grow there. If hemp isn't growing there, something's going to grow there and in this case it was volunteer canola. So again, volunteer canola, volunteer wheat, buckwheat, any of those that are very difficult to clean out of hemp causes an issue. So 
that seed cleaner, when we clean our grain, our grain, whether it's for seed or for human consumption, we clean it to 99.95% purity. So it's, uh, it's an awful hit to the producer that when he gets his first check and he notices that there's up to 20% dockage on his hemp, but that's, those are some of the reasons. It's, it's common to have 11 to 12% dockage is about as low as we can possibly go, it seems, because we need to cling to that standard. Again, if you open up your bag of hemp parts and there's a wheat seed in there or if there's something that shouldn't be there, like a sclerotia body from uh, sclerotinia that looks like a mouse excrement, <laughs> again, not good on sales. <laughs> Just uh, not good for, uh, uh, for the callbacks. And so that's the reason that we clean su to such high standards. So I mentioned the fertility, and this is uh, a, a fertilizer uptake uh, a trial that we did a number of years ago, and of course we're we uh, compared it to canola, our other cash crop. So nitrogen, uh, the plant will utilize upwards of 200 pounds or 200 kg. It re re resorts to the same thing: 200 pounds per acre, 200 kg per hectare is what the plant will actually uptake. And uh, compared to canola, about 200. But when you haul that grain to either the processor, to Midlands, to to uh, hemp production services you're removing about 40 pounds of, 40 kg of, of uh, nitrogen from the field. Canola, you're removing about 65, so the efficiency there is a little bit better. Most of that nitrogen can be found in the stalk, so if the stalk is left in the field, uh, you get a couple rains on it, it rets that uh, nitrogen is a mobile nutrient, so it gets leaches back into the soil, so you don't lose it, so you, you, know, you don't have to put another 200 pounds on the next year. Phosphorus, the same thing, you need about 50 pounds. Uh, phosphorus helps for early season vigor, so it's a very important uh, to have plenty of phosphorus and close phosphorus. Phosphorus is actually a non-mobile non nutrient, and so you need to have that close enough to the seed without causing any seed burn. The one that I found the most interesting, I guess, was potassium. Potassium use in the plant is for straw strength, uh, and when you have a stalk that's five to six feet tall, uh, or th two or three meters, four meters, Obviously, that's full of potassium. That's what is the pumping system for all the nutrients in the water up and down the plant, and that's the role of potassium. So it does utilize a lot of potassium. So the, some of the concerns, I guess, is if we start to utilize hemp as a green-only product, that we should be making sure that we take a look at our potassium levels in our soils. Um, but again, as a mobile nutrient, if we have it, if we can ret and let the uh, rain uh, wash that nutrient back into the soil, then we're okay. So we got about three minutes left here on my uh, scale. So I got a number of pictures here. And again, these aren't meant to scare you, but to make you aware of what hemp will do to combines and to... Uh, so how many people actually have uh, experience combining hemp, let's just say, in the... So, okay, you can see the scars and the knuckles. <laughs> so this was my... This was where I spent most of my time, I guess, as far as my... my uh, introduction to hemp and, and how I harvested it and we did have a much better, this is a 1978 Hagee uh, Series B, I believe, uh, co small plot combine, uh, all beat up but you can see there's hardly anything in the mouth so it's very easy, if anything starts to plug it's very easy to unplug it and that's one of the things that is a huge benefit. So we did have a nicer, a newer Winter Steiger but it had just too much, uh, too much in front and too much, you, you, here I could put a summer student in the back, grab him or her by the ankles, they could get in there, uh, start to cut away, and I could pull them out again, so it was much easier. Then I traded up to this. This is my current combine um, that we use for hemp. Um, my father-in-law was a John Deere dealer, and I did a lot of custom combining um, back in the 90s, so it was the combine that I was most familiar with. It does hemp very well, whether conventional or rotary, uh, either one, so it's the combine that I picked uh, to, to utilize, and it's a, that's a Draper header with a P auger on it. Uh, Draper headers we find work a little bit better than auger headers. You want the hemp to fall onto the Draper, get to the middle of the combine and try and come in as straight as possible so it doesn't start to tangle up and then start wrapping on insides of the machine. Case IH is another very uh, popular combine for hemp in the prairies. This was a picture of a combine in southern Alberta where they have much drier conditions. Uh, a lot of that hemp is grown under irrigation there. And you can see the dust on that combine. 
the, the idea of this picture, like hemp is also an oil seed, but very, very, very volatile also. So this person would have a leaf blower in his cab and after every hopper, he would blow the dust off because he was getting static electricity and there'd be fires on the end of the auger, uh, just about virtually anywhere. And so uh, to prevent that, he would go out with a, a leaf blower and blow the dust off after every time. I didn't have a picture of a, of a Lexian combine, but this is the inside of a Lexian combine uh, with two rotors. Hemp can't decide which rotor it likes to go to, <laughs> and it won't decide. And then so there's a tug of war at the beginning of those two, auger, or two rotors. And so as far as a combine that is probably the least popular for combining hemp in Canada, uh, the new Lexian series are, are probably that, just because of that system right there. It just plugs up in the middle of that happens that my brother-in-law, so guess what combines he has? Both Lexians, so <laughs> thus the John Deere came onto the yard. So this is, a, this is a series of pictures of where hemp will wrap, and it will wrap just about anywhere. Um, on the blade, you want to make sure that your knives and your guard are, sh are sharp, otherwise you start to get, this is the cleaning fan, it'll wrap in there. Uh, this is the front axle of uh, John Deere combine. All there is is a little bit of a spline, uh, but if you don't protect it, um, I have a picture here uh, coming up. I should have had it right after, but uh, then that's what happens. And then that's, you know, basically you've got to cut that off. Uh, this is inside the John Deere. Just after the rotor, there's a beater there that beats it down into either the straw chopper. And you can see against the wall, it starts to wrap along that bearing. Uh, so what I did is I, I put these little pieces of basically baler belt, bolted them on there, made sure that they're all the same weight to keep it in balance to rub the wall and it's kind of freed up from, from, uh, from doing that. So I'm trying to show some pictures of how, how things can get better. Uh, this is being the back of a Case IH again. Um, you know, that's what your combine looks like. It's perfect for Halloween if you're <laughs> to be harvesting near, uh, near Halloween because it looks like a flying witch with all the fiber hanging out the back. Any little area that can get, uh, get hemp, so this is another thing. Uh, they were having trouble with that roller, so he just put a little piece of plywood in there uh, to divert hemp, uh, and away he went. So some of this stuff can, you know, you can go 100 meters and, and you're down, you know, so a simple piece of plywood strategically placed uh, gets you rolling fairly quickly. This is the piece, this is where I should have had that picture right after. So this is the PVC pipe I cut in half, duct taped it onto the, onto the axle, and no more problems. Anywhere there's a wire that you don't want ripped off, tape it up. Duct tape is going to be your best friend. Get yourself a Captain Hook because you're going to, your arms, if they're like mine, they're not, I yeah, ask Mark to come over to reach those hard to reach places, but uh, something like that helps out to get, uh, get it out of places. And I mentioned fires and you're, it's really, you're not really a hemp farmer until your combine starts on fire, I think. And I was lucky enough or unlucky enough, whatever you want to call it, to have a, a fire in my uh, back of the rotor the first year I combine. To alleviate that, we harvest much higher moisture, around 17, 18% moisture. The fiber stays together. It's not as dry. It's not as brittle. Uh, it just so happened that, I'll show you a video shortly. Um, I was positioning myself for the video, left two acres of hemp out in the field, combined all night because they were calling for rain the next day, left that two acres, come back the next day or two days later, or actually it was two weeks later. Ran that through the combine, it was dry as can be, and uh, went to a canola field. By the time uh, supper time came on, there was smoke coming out of the back of the rotor. But once you know that it's not going to burn the combine down, you water it down uh, as best you can and, and continue. That's just uh, one of the, in Canada, that's what we use for a moisture tester for grain, so it's a Labtronics 919. Uh, if anybody wants to know how to get one, I'm not sure what you guys use here. I, I remember Conrad had kind of a handheld thing that you can do, so I'm sure you have a lot of that. Storage and harvest, running out of time, past time here. So uh, this is, these are the silos or the bins that we use. Um, so when you harvest at that high moisture level, basically you have about four hours before that crop starts to heat in the truck or in the combine. So we never really harvest a full hopper. Uh, we'll harvest till it gets about just above the window, put that into a, a truck and, and get it on these aeration bins as quick as possible. Uh, so on the right is the fan. Uh, basically for every horsepower of fan, uh, you can put about 200 bushels 
of, uh, of hemp seed into that bin, so you've got to try and level that to make sure that you can, that moisture can escape. And then after w about one day, you have to empty that bin completely so you don't have any pockets of chaff or anything where the hemp can start to heat and again cause uh, bacteria. The things that uh, bacteria loves is heat, temperature, time temperature and moisture. Moisture, you're at 18%, can't control that so much. Temperature, we're harvesting, it's usually about uh, 20 degrees to 25 degrees Celsius, can't control that, but we can't control the time that it has there. Um, if we need to put some additional heat, we'll do that, and if not, then we'll just throw it right into a, a batch dryer or a continuous dryer. So, this was a picture of uh, my, myself and my wife in February, and I think when, when you're in the hemp industry, you can often feel like you are in the rapids. You're going to have ups and downs and you're going to be scared as crap some days and wondering if you can ever get through it. The next day we went to a winery. It was much nicer. It was, uh, you know, it was surreal, you know, the tranquility and everything was nice and sometimes with hemp it's like that. Uh, so hopefully most of the time you can uh, experience the tranquility so that you can sit back, have a beer and reflect. And it seems that no matter how tough that harvest year was, you know, you'll talk to the, some of the producers, I'm not ever going to grow that crop again. And then they get a check and then, whoa, <laughs> Where, what's the seed availability for next year? And so I'm just going to, I'll just quick, quickly run this video uh, to a certain extent just to prove that it can be done. Um, <laughs> I threw this song in there too just because of the John Deere, obviously. But, so this is me uh, doing this field. This is where I left that little bit of... Uh, uh, product after a while. It's a 35 foot header, uh, 9870 John Deere. I'm traveling about four miles an hour, doing about 20 acres an hour. Um, I had I had John Deere issues. I didn't have any hemp issues other than the fire after. Um, but really cuts very nice, uh, uh, like nothing actually. So. I throw a lot of that caution to you because it can happen and it has happened, but if you get the right timing uh, and the right moisture level, uh, you can really cruise through this crop and you can be very, very successful at growing it. So I won't play it all, but there's, uh, I don't think we're going to do questions right now, but there's my contact information, my Twitter handle. I'm here for the two days, uh, actually right up until Sunday, if anybody's hanging around till then. So. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and sorry for going over. A no, that's quite all right. <laughs> Fantastic to have you here. Thank you very much indeed, Jeff. Um, fantastic to see how your operation runs, and I certainly had a, a, a great deal of information there that will be of uh, a, a huge amount of pertinence here for our crowd.